something. And I wanted to talk a little bit tonight, and we're going to start this VOA by renewing your spiritual passion. Is there anyone here that could experience, coming here and you're hungry? Wow. Anyone here that is thirsty? And just sense it. Just say yes with me. Just let me hear. Say yes. I'm, I'm hungry for something more. I have seen a lot of beautiful things. And let me just give you a little bit of the background of this message. We were, uh, as I'm saying, we were in the Middle East. And I had about 11 major assignments. And one of them was to go into an area where the gospel had never been before. It's a region with about a million and a half people. And I've shared before at VOA, I tried several times to enter into this region. And every single time there was an attack that stopped me. And I had a team with me, and right before, right before we were about to land, uh, Imran Khan was ousted as the prime minister. So we knew there was going to be chaos and demonstration. This is just recently, the last week of May. So we are entering in there in May, and one again of the assignment was eventually, we headed down to the Afghan border, and we were doing all these different assignments. I'm going to just make the story short that we did end up, and there was one little crippled girl that was one of those key miracles. She's sitting there up front, Muslim girl, four years old. And we can see Lily with one of my team members that was praying. And her limbs and her limbs. And she comes up on the stage. But I didn't know she was also born blind. So afterwards, I have this beautiful picture. She runs on the stage and she comes up, she grabs my nose. And I realized, and that's when we're hearing. I think it was the grandpa that was just sharing the testimony that, I mean, she was crippled and she's never walked. But she was born blind. And then in the next moment, and several thousand people ended up in that area where the gospel has never been before, just surrendered to Jesus. It was just a beautiful, beautiful. So we ended up with many assignments, including being with some of my Shia friends and family, and went from place to place. Eleven different assignments. And one of the last pictures, because I went through my pictures today, right before the service, as a memory stone. But I was tired. I, I was battle tired, I'm honest, because there's the battle you fight before the battle you win. And then sometimes it's the battle you fight after the battle you won. Uh, I don't know if you have experiences, and I do not always know which one is worse. So when you're coming home and you are jet lagged and you are tired and, and you have gone from one thing to the other, you don't realize that your emotional tank has gone down. You're being in two different storms, and one of the storms is when Jesus is asleep in the middle of the storm. And by the way, if you're in the middle of that storm, bring your pillow because Jesus brought his cushion. So if you're in that storm, that storm is a storm where you're going to wear the enemy out by resting. It's called the hard work of rest. But the disciple had a spiritual storm, they had an emotional storm, and they had a physical storm. There was water in the boat, there was wind there, and the Bible says they were afraid. And there was a spiritual storm. Where are you, Jesus? And he's right there resting. So that's an invitation. But then there's another storm. And at this storm, Jesus is not in the boat. And this storm, he's up on the mountain and he's praying for us. And that's the storm I just finished. This is the fourth watch type of a faith. And that is in the last minute. Why do you wait to show up at 11.59? And, and I believe he's just teaching us how to trust in this season. To totally, totally trust him. But the battle fatigue, so when you're finished with that, that's also a storm to learn how to walk on water. But it's also on both of these storms on the other side, there's breakthrough. It's just they look differently. And according to the book of John, the second storm, you have to learn to row against the wind. So this is when the wind are contrary and is trying to stop you from reaching the assignment. So when you've been in one of those storms, the important is in the first storm that you are resting. Say rest. So that you receive. Say receive. So that you become. Say you become. So that you release. I didn't realize that I had so little fuel. So when I came home, I suddenly said, honey, I need some rest. And it is Sabbath. I can't remember the last time I had a Sabbath. And my wife, with her wisdom, she said, Honey, why don't you just go right outside, sit there, and just rest? And I decided I had some wisdom that was greater than my wife's wisdom. I have this red electrical bicycle. 
And it looked so nice in the garage, and I don't have much experience on this, but I decide to go around the golf cart roads, and that goes 35 miles an hour. It's a pretty fast electric bike. So I am heading down in Peachtree City. It's a beautiful day. This is my Sabbath. I'm going to rest. Finally, I'm getting to rest and just enjoying the wind and the beauty and the splendor. And in the next moment, there's this demonized squall that is coming. If you had looked, I actually have it on the phone. I had somebody that loved animals and said, what happened to the squall? I said, what happened to me when I ended up in the emergency room? I mean, so this squall went right like this, and I thought, wow, it's just... But then it went in the woods and came right back, hit the front, and I'm trying to to stop and save the squall, but I hit it, and I fly over. No helmet. Not much wisdom. And I'm flying, and I hit my elbow and my neck and my back, and the next moment I'm calling my wife, I'm on my way to the emergency room. And I am just beaten up physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I'm looking at the memory stones about the past. And so I'm sitting there and I'm just giving you the background of this sermon. I'm going to try to jump right into it. But wow, I'm just having this battlefield. And I'm sitting there in my desk in our living room, feeling a little overwhelmed. And just remember, whatever overwhelms you will shape you. Let me say that one more time. Whatever overwhelms you will shape you. At that moment, I was fatigue. Say fatigue. And when fatigue comes in, the enemy pushes the button of fear. Say fear. fear. Then the next thing the enemy does, say failure. Fear. I felt like a failure. And the enemy reminds me about all my failure. And the next one is forsaken. Say forsaken. He isolates you. You can be here among all those different people and you can experience because your emotional tank is low. The enemy pushes the button and fear comes in. And then in the next moment, he starts to blackmail you. Reminds you about your failure and then you are isolated, forsaken. So I'm sitting there and instead of shining, I'm whining. I'm playing my violin and they're feeling sorry for myself and talking about what kind of what a hero I've been and here I am being attacked again by the devil and I do not realize and I have people like Dr. Mike Hutchin that comes in and help me with some PTSD now and then but this time it is post-traumatic squall disorder. <laughs> they said, did Taliban do that to you? I said, no, it's squall. I'm coming there. And it was very painful because I'm sitting there and just, I mean, here you have a demonic squall attacking me. I mean, I just survived the front line. I'm coming back home and this is supposed to be shalom and that's the word for this year. And all the opposite seems to happen. Anybody been there? You're fixing one leak and there's another leak. But anyway, then here's the scripture verses. Then in the next moment, I could hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit when I just sat there and felt a little oppressed or depressed. And I felt this whisper of the Spirit that says, Leif, do you love me? Open up your Bible to John chapter 21. Holy is his love. John chapter 21. And let's start with, I would actually connect with extra verse in honor bishop on this. And that is verse 13 when he says, Jesus came and he took the bread. And this is important. And he gave it to them. Likewise, the fish. There's something about this Eucharist thing. He took the bread, communion. And we're going to get back to this. This is now the third time. Say the third time. That Jesus showed himself to the disciple after he was raised from the dead. So this was the third time. And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Leif, do you love me more than your ministry? Is intimacy more important than ministry? Is your alignment with me more important than the assignment? And so this started that day. So he brings me to this scripture verses. Leif, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said then, feed my lambs, including the lambs that are putting up pictures on the screen of you. Feed my lambs. 
He said to him again second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Say grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he will be glorified to God. Just look at a couple of scripture verses a little bit earlier. If I was going to name the message something today, I would say one of them would be of renewing your passion. Another one would be burning brightly without burning out. How many here would like to burn oil, oil, oil of intimacy? And not just experiencing a fire, but to stay on fire and continue to burn and to be a burning one. And what I'm realizing that Simon himself, and we're about to see that in a few moments, but let's just see in John 20, we're going to connect a few things. In verse 30, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. We are seeing in the verses before that Jesus had done some amazing signs and miracles in the front of them. And then after these things, Jesus showed them himself again to the disciple in the way he showed himself to Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel, Cana the Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee. And the two others of his disciples, they were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Say fishing. This is something that is very interesting. I will put it together. But I want you to capture for a few moments. Why would Simon Peter go fishing? I want you to ask that question. Say, why would Simon go fishing? Do you remember the story from Luke chapter 5? The last time when he was out there fishing. And when he was fishing there, he met this one person on the shore that suddenly showed him a different way of fishing. And when he saw who he was, I mean, he just became so overwhelmed. He was so much in awe in the awesomeness of who he met that he recognized this is Messiah, this is Lord. And it was not just a salvation message, it was a lordship message. And at that moment, he realized he was Lord and he left the regular fishing and he became a follower of Jesus. Let me just make a little statement here. If you were to ask me, Leif, who is your favorite character in the whole Bible? Somebody just asked us that question in Brazil. And I would say, oh, it is John. And tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about John. But why is it that you love John more than maybe any other character? Because he is the one that I would like to be. He is the one that I am. Um, there's something about John that has something that for 12 years I've been pursuing something that John had with Jesus that I saw no, nobody else had. And I think Bishop showed it beautifully when he had Micah putting his head against his chest, describing the relationship John had. When other people are asking a question, John knew how to lean for the answer. John had his identity, he had his intimacy. But when it comes to Peter, if you ask me the honest question, Leif, in the Bible, which one of the characters in the Bible do you feel that you are the most like? And I would say Peter. And I can be honest, I don't like that. I wish I was a little bit more like John. It's not that I don't want to be in my shoes, but there's something about this Peter. And people say, oh, you're so much like Peter. And there's so many of the things about Peter that I dislike, including I'm looking sometimes at the mirror that is a little bit fractured sometimes. And I don't see me the way he sees me. And I know that we are made in his image, so I'm just here to go on a little journey because I believe that here there's a holy fire right tonight that is going to set you up for the Pentecost fire. But to do that, you have to meet a previous fire. 
And so we are going to look actually at this fire because this is where we're going to renew our passion. You're going to see that Peter, and I learned that day as I'm sitting at my desk, there was something that happened with him and something is starting to happen with me. I have not got this message yet. And most of the time, like tomorrow, I will share a message because I've been 12 years in the message and I don't know if the message got me. But today, it is raw. I'm just after something. There's something I'm hungry for. I'm seeing a Pentecost. I am seeing that a person like a Simon Peter, I saw the end, how he ended up. Including what Jesus described, by the end of his life, he is courageous. In the end of his life, I mean, he was burning brightly without burning out. And so will you. But many of us, we are trying to head towards Pentecost with us first dealing with this very thing that he is going to deal with Peter. So when he asked the three questions, do you love me? And he's asking you the question, do you love me? Do you love me more than anything else? Is the very love? And if you were to ask the question, Peter, does Jesus love you? He would say, yes, no doubt about it. And Peter, do you love him? Yes. I left everything to follow him. Left my family. I've served him. Hey, by the way, I'm the one that walked on water. Do you remember? And he could just go in with all the memory stones of who he was and his experience with Jesus. I was defending him. I mean, I took that sword when they were coming. I mean, Peter had a lot of different qualities. He was a lion, but he had not learned how to be a lamb. And Jesus was a lion that became a lamb so that we could become lambs that become lion. So when we roar, people will gather and not scatter because it comes from the Lamb's heart. Your identity is in the Lamb, so your authority is in the Lion. And Jesus is the Lamb and He is the Lion. Be careful, this kind of a thinking can lead to dancing. So anyway, so here we are. He starts this journey. Peter goes back to fishing. Let me just describe for the sake of time. And as they are going back fishing... They can't get anything. Do you remember last time that happened? That was my life. And I remember as a young Norwegian, be fishing all night, getting very little. And then having an encounter, fresh encounter, and suddenly you realize there's more fish than you can handle. I don't know if you have experience in that. That's when I started going into some of the, I started to do some deep sea fishing. And that's also where the big waves are but also the big fish. So when you're experiencing the Lordship of Jesus, he's not just my savior like in 84, but when actually when Dr. Randy Clark prayed for me in 1995, 11 years after my salvation, he became Lord. And I can be honest with you, my fervor, my passion, I would do anything for him. But the reality that that was one of my big problems. So on my journey, there was a lot of brokenness and there's disappointments. There's things that has happened on the journey. And today we're going to deal with his darkest moment, Simon's darkest moment. What kept this courageous lion from being the person that Jesus wanted to use and send a Pentecost? What is keeping him from that very thing? And I was looking at the scriptures. I was digging in. So they are going fishing and they're coming in to the shore. They are tired and they are professional fishermen. I am sure that his hands are pretty dry and hurting. He has not fished for over three years. And then suddenly there's this guy on the shore that says, Hey, boys. Hey, children. <laughs> Landon, I don't know if that will work with you in Canada because I know you're a professional fisherman. <laughs> hey, did you get any fish? And these guys is more and more frustrated. When was the last time that happened? And then he said, Hey. Why don't you just throw it over on the right side? They have nothing to lose and everything to gain. I believe this is a word for some of you right now. You tried everything there is in the previous season. There's some of you, even after the COVID-19 season, you're trying to go back to what is familiar. Because you're no longer what you used to be, but you have not yet become what you're supposed to become. There's a sunset of one season, but there's a sunrise of another season. You've had a Friday moment and you've had a long Saturday, but I'm here to say Sunday is coming. And for some of you, it was maybe a 16-year Saturday. Some of you, it was a two-year Saturday. It was almost 18 years from Dr. Randy Clark prayed for me until I saw the result of some of the words that he spoke. That's after a broken neck, broken back, body cast, 11 years of opiates. 
and there's body here, so I'm not saying it easy, but my smile is a generous smile. God is good. I'm not here to try to do anything else and say, but I know there is something more. I'm hungry for something more. And that day while I'm sitting there like Peter, there's this side of me that wanted to go back to fishing again. And the guys join him going back to fishing again. I have met pastor after pastor that has come up to me in this season and said, if, if I had something else I could do that makes more money, I would have given up a long time ago. I met the pastor on Saturday that was just describing, I wanted to give up in this season, but I had to help him. Sunday is coming. But in the middle of this frustration, the emotional tank is down. Peter is pretty much burned out, and we're about to see quickly some of the things that has taken place. And then in the middle of this journey, as they are coming in, we know the story. They go, and there's more fish than they can handle. And I, I'm stealing this from Dr. Randy Clark. He was in Brazil, but suddenly Simon Peter, John says, because they cannot recognize him. Let me just say, there's a season that we're coming in. You're not going to recognize the way he showed up in the previous season. And the way he's showing up is differently, and you need to be aware of the nearness and the way he shows up. Because I got so familiar the way he's supposed to show up in a meeting, but now he shows up in another meeting. I mean, he shows up in a different way in the next meeting. And you have to be sensitive, but it's interesting that John said, hey, it's the Lord. How did John recognize it is the Lord when nobody could see him? Because he recognized that still small voice. Hey, boys, did you get, hey, children, did you get any fish? He recognized that voice. And in the middle of all the noise and all the storms, can you recognize that still small voice? We're living in a season we need to learn to recognize that little voice. My sheep hears my voice. We know the story. He comes in. Because actually, here's the thing from Dr. Randy Clark. He put on his cloak. Why would he do that? And here's what Randy Clark said. Perhaps when he's jumping out of the boat, he expects to walk on water again. Because he had just his trunks on. Why would you clothe yourself up before you jump out of the boat? But when he's coming in, Jesus said, hey, Let's get some fish. And here's where I want to head with this. And as Peter brings in some fish, Jesus has cooked breakfast. Oh, I feel this evening Jesus wants to have breakfast on the beach with some of us. There's something about the bread and the fish in this season you're going to have. And he's sitting down there and Jesus has this bread. He's connecting this communion. There's a, this Eucharist that is taking place that has more to do with forgiveness and all to do with reconciliation. And as they're sitting there together, that's when Jesus eventually connecting and says, do you love me? Three times. How many times did Peter deny him? How many times did Jesus say, do you love me? And by the way, do you remember the first time of fishing? Here's the second time of fishing. And then a couple of more things. Let me take you back on the journey. In John 13, there's this beautiful place. One of my favorite verses, the Love Awakening book came out of that. As I have loved you. As I have loved you, meaning washing the feet of Judas. Those Muslims that want to kill me. As I have loved you, love one another. And that's how the world is going to see who you are. By the way, we love one another. And then eventually Jesus described, one of you are about to betray me. And everybody is in the room like Peter. Who is it? And then eventually when Jesus starts to describe, Peter is like, not me. I mean, if, if everybody else does it, not me. I mean, I'm in. I am committed. I'm the last guy that would do it. And his intention was good. His direction was not good. And your intention doesn't take you to destiny. Your direction does. So even if I have a good intention to go to the airport of Atlanta, but I go in the wrong way. You can pray for me, fast for me. You can do all those things, but if I'm going the wrong way, my intention can be good, but my intention doesn't take me the direction does. And Peter is actually on a little wrong direction. And Jesus describes to him before the crow three times, you're going to deny me. 
And many of us, including myself, I was, I would never do that. But that day, sitting at my office desk, I'm realizing that I'm not thinking the way I'm supposed to think. I had just been there looking at the memory stone of what Jesus just did. But in the middle of it, you can forget because when the fatigue comes in, fear comes in, all these things comes in. And here's what the enemy is doing with him. Why is he not bold? Why is not courageous? Where is that life that some people maybe have seen on the video and everything else? I'm sitting there whining. I can explain what has happened. And at this moment, he said, come, let's take some time together. And he goes back. And he says, Leif, your intention was good, but then the chaos starts to happen. And they're coming to get to Jesus. Peter is still there. I'm going to be with you. And he follows John, but they are tired. How do I know? Because in Matthew 26, when Jesus had his roughest moment, in Matthew 26, at that moment, he's just getting grieved. And then the three guys, he brings them with him. And guess what happened to them? They fall asleep. Jesus comes and wakes them up and says, come on, guys, wake up. Be aware because you don't wake up. This can lead to temptation. Second time, he wakes them up. Third time, how many times? Three times he has to wake up those three guys. Why are they asleep? When Jesus needs them the most. Fatigue. And I think we are in a season of a lot of battle fatigue. That's why I'm interested that we need this beautiful breakfast encounter with Jesus. And here is what I'm about to say. This is not a condemnation, but an invitation. Could I say that one more time? The breakfast one on the beach, when I started to look at it, it was not Jesus said, hey, I'm bringing you back. What happened, the Greek word for the coal of fire that is used, there's only used twice. One of them is in a moment when they are sitting there on the beach and Jesus, there's this coal of fire. And when Peter comes in, he sees that coal of fire. Guess what it does to him? It takes him right back to the last time there was a coal of fire. What does that do to him? Trauma came in. It was not just trauma that came in, but the very thing that I would never have done. The very thing, this is the worst day of his life. The worst moment of his life. And he's tried to hide it. That's one of the reasons he was not there on Friday. He was not there on Saturday. He was not there on Sunday. Because he's full of guilt, shame, and fear. So he is crippled with some of those things. And Jesus has a different plan. And he has a different plan for each one of us. There's a Pentecost for us coming. Another Pentecost. A new fire that is coming. And with this wind, there's going to be fire and there's going to be wine. The wine is going to give you the pleasure. The wind is going to give you the power. And the fire is going to give you the passion. Being burning oil, oil, oil of intimacy. And I felt that tonight. And right before my session, Joanne Moody said, I see some angels Earlier today when I walked after filming a couple of sessions, one person just came up, can I pray for you? And they saw these three angels releasing wind. And I knew it was wind of renewal and refreshing. Then somebody texts me right before the service. He is my best friend. He said, I just see these three angels tonight. And they are sending winds of refreshing and renewal. I'm just saying that to encourage you. There's something... He's not going to treat you based upon your history, but your destiny. Could I say that one more time? He will not treat you based upon your history, but your destiny. When he comes in here, and I, oh, I just sense in this, this painful, painful moment that comes into his life. He sees these coals of fire. Guess what it does? And I'm going to land with this last story. He's following John and they're coming from the outer court. John, he's able to move inside the outer court. We were just in Peshawar at one of the top leaders right there on the Afghan border. And they had this big fortress. But because of the favor that we had, we were able to come on the inside of this. John had favor. And then eventually, Psst, he is with me. And he had an opportunity eventually to go from the outer court into the inner court. And right in the middle of the fatigue, there is this fire. And you remember the story as he is going to the fire. The Bible says it was cold. So he's going to this fire when he's emotionally tired. He's fatigued. He's pretty much burned out. And in the middle of this fire, he goes there to warm himself up. I'm here just to describe because some of you, even in this season, the enemy is building a fire at your weakest moment to try to get you to warm yourself up. 
And that's the moment when they cry, oh, are you not the one? Or are you not? And we know the story by the third time. Fear, shame, and guilt came in. He covered up. He was hiding. And he started his journey. And eventually experiencing in John 20 when Jesus shows up and just filled the room with the presence. Peace be upon you. Jesus showed him the hands on the side. Even experienced, received the Holy Spirit. But still something were missing. There's another appearance of Jesus. And he knows this is the calling. He wants to serve Jesus. But there's still a dark hole in his soul. Something is still missing. There's something that Jesus wants to heal. And I feel he wanted to heal something in my life, in your life. Maybe it is disappointment. Could be shame. Could be fear. Could be guilt. But whatever you're going through. And then here we are. Jesus is going into those deepest here. Do you love me? He brings him back to that place. And then he starts to describe after the third, love you. He gets offended and he says, Lord, and he gets offended. You know all things. And at that moment, Jesus goes, let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you who you are, Leif Hatland. This is who I see about you. And he starts to describe Peter's destiny. And he's here to describe your destiny. He's going to heal our past. Give us a fresh encounter for today. But he's going to give you glorious and hope and a baptism of hope towards tomorrow and the future. So what is happening in this incredible encounter? I'm sitting there at my desk, getting now overwhelmed. Before I was overwhelmed by fear, I'm starting getting overwhelmed by hope. And whatever overwhelms you will shape you. Can we stand to our feet? I just felt that there is a fresh baptism of love. I just felt that he's asking you today, do you love me. I just sense I wanted Dr. Mike to come up. And I wanted also Joanne Moody if she's here. But I saw her earlier. But I felt tonight that is there anyone else that could need a fresh baptism of love? I believe this is the baptism of love 2.0. And the reason I'm saying that my first baptism of love was when I knew how much the Father loved me. But this invitation for Peter, what was missing in Peter's life just listen to me. What was missing in Peter's life, Peter did not love Peter the way Jesus loved Peter. I'm going to say that two more times. What was missing in Peter's life, Peter did not love Peter the way Jesus loved Peter. One more time. Peter, yeah, John had experienced it, but this time Peter gets experiencing it. After the third love you, he goes to a waiting period. He has nothing to prove any longer. And he waits there for Pentecost. And then you start to see the boldness. You see the courage in Acts chapter 2. Then you start to see continuing there in Acts chapter 3. This incredible miracle that is happening. He says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have I can give to you. How many here would like to have something to give to people? But I am just so excited. And then you're going into Acts chapter 4. And even when they were in prison, there was no courage. They start to describe about the healing. And by the time you get to Acts 19, 10, everyone in Asia had heard about this good news about Jesus. And then in verse 11 in Acts 19, extraordinary miracle. You went from ordinary miracle to extraordinary miracle. And in one moment, you just walked in the shadow of Peter and you're getting healed. This makes me jealous. Because I know there's something more. Even if it is accidentally, people are walking my shadow when I walk in the mosque. I'm not yet seeing some of the things I've seen in the book of Acts. And this is an invitation for more. But I felt there was a couple of things based upon a couple of prophetic words. Can we just hold out our hands and just getting overwhelmed by Jesus. He's just building a fresh fire from us. And the purpose when you see the coal of fire, it is not to take you back and rub into your failure. It is not to come and take you back and say, hey, let me just show you your shame, fear, and guilt. It is he wants to heal your past. He wants to set you free, free, free from your past. He doesn't want you to carry this any longer. And it's interesting in the book of Mark, even after the resurrection, when it was Mary Magdalene, 
that was the first one to experience it. And then on the walk to Emmaus, there was the second appearance of Jesus. These guys got experience. That was the burning heart fellowship. But then the third appearance is actually, the scripture says it in 1 Corinthians, but that is actually to make sure, make sure to marry that, especially Peter. It says there in the book of Mark, especially Peter, when you go and tell them I'm alive, but especially Peter, especially Bill, especially Lance, especially Randy, especially Leif when you're sitting there at that desk, especially you. And I felt that the calling also today is going to be, follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. There's a fire, 3,001 day. That's a different way of fishing. I know Richie gets excited about that. Can we just hold up our hands and holy, holy, holy spirit. I just thank you so much for your faithfulness, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Even this evening, you're building a little fire from us. A fire for us to invite us just to come and sit here. Let's have a little conversation. And you break bread with us and fish. You just connect with us. And then you just want to have this conversation. Because whew, there's something, whew, disappointments. There's something that sting on feeling unwanted. There's something, chronic pain that continue to be there. There's something that you want to touch from our past so that we can get ready for tomorrow. Even for some of the trauma that came. And even as I just wanted to honor Dr. Mike, who has several times ministered to me when this fight flight comes in because of trauma and disappointment. I'm just even asking tonight, and I'm just sensing that if you're here in this room and you're just sensing that God is speaking to me today, I'm just sensing I need a fresh fresh encounter. I want us just to come to the altar, the ones that is hungry and thirst. But I'm sensing it's going to be a fire. And I felt that I'm going to release some of the love, but Mike is going to bring the healing, healing from the past. So any trauma, anything that has happened. Whoa! And I know that many of us, we're hungry for this Pentecost fire. I'm just being honest with you. I'm not there. I'm now in a waiting period. I'm allowing that fire to just take me through my past. What I didn't tell you that day. And my wife knows the story, but when my car accident was there, the person that drove me into the mountain wall and for 22 years, I forgave, forgave him, but he came and wanted just to negotiate and kind of pay me off and he didn't want to take responsibility. And we were left there with my wife and with medical bills and it was a tough season and I've had pain since then. But at that moment when I sat with the fire, we were heading to Norway and I made sure to go because he came to my mind, I want you to forgive and I said, I have forgiven. Now I want you to sit down with him. And I want you to love him without bringing up anything. And I sat for four and a half hours with him. And something just was taking place. We just connected. I built a fire with him. And we broke bread together. There was a connection. So even in relationship, I sense this is for someone. But as he's just taking me through my past and just visiting those moments, I know he has a glorious future for each one of us. He's going to prophesy, and that's what I saw Joanne Moody is going to do. He's going to prophesy the destiny, the future that he has for each one of us, for you to be able to see, whoa, you on fire, burning, burning brightly without burning out. Dr. Mike Hutchin, let's just allow this little surge of our hearts to take place today as we're coming to the fire and the love going into the deepest hidden core pain in our life.